Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to this week's Wednesday interlude in which I discuss my reading progress of the books that I have been rereading since last Wednesday and in which I turn the spotlight on East Lynn and Mrs Henry Wood. But before that I can confirm that I finished reading The Jewel in the Crown, the first book in the Raj Quartet for the March of the Mammoth Channel Challenge at last. This book is part of my British Empire project for 2019. This book was a challenging read and I've, and I've explained why in a previous video. Did it ultimately prove to be a worthwhile read? First let me tell you what this book is about. Actually Paul Scott himself tells us in the opening paragraphs. He wrote, this is the story of a rape of the events that led up to it and followed it and the place in which it happened. There are the action, the people and the place, all of which are interrelated but in their totality incommunicable in isolation from the moral continuum of human affairs. In the Bibigar Gardens case there were several arrests and an investigation. There was no trial in the judicial sense. Since then, people have said there was a trial of sorts going on. In fact, such people say the affair that began that evening of August the 9th, 1942, in Mayapur, ended with the spectacle of two nations in violent opposition. Not for the first time, nor as yet for the last, because they were then still locked in an imperial embrace of such long-standing and subtlety it was no longer possible for them to know whether they hated or loved one another, or what it was that held them together and seemed to have confused the image of their separate de de destinies. It is interesting that Scott sets the significant event on which the novel pivots on the evening of the 9th of August 1942. The Quit India Movement, or the August Movement, was a movement launched at the Bombay session of the All India Congress Committee by Gandhi on the 8th of August 1942, during World War II, demanding an end to British rule of India. The events that took place in India in, India in 1942 led to the eventual end of the British Raj and independence for India in 1947. Scott's method, as indicated in, in the passage I have read above, was to create a pattern of interrelated narratives told as monologues by a cross-section of people in Mayapur to explore the relationships between the various strata of Indian society and the attitudes and behaviours of the British rulers of British India. His narratives move backwards and forwards in time, in which characters comment on other characters within the story. Reading this novel was an interesting experience because I have never read a novel organised in the way that Scott decided to organise this novel. Did I enjoy it? I'm not sure. I learned a lot from it and it will inform my understanding of the period and of the issues and events that took place in India at that time as I continue my exploration of the British Empire. Now let us turn the spotlight on the novel East Lynn and its author, Mrs. Henry Wood. When so many modern novels take as their subject the life and emotions of one person, to whom all the other characters in the books are subservient, is it refreshing to turn to the full-blooded stories written, it may be many years ago, but still popular for the very reason that they are full-blooded stories. Of these, Eastlin may be taken as a perfect example. First published in 1861, it has stood the test of time and remains, next to Dickens, the most widely read of what are misleadingly termed Victorian novels. There's nothing Victorian in the accepted um, sense of the word about East Lynn. It is a drama of passion, of intrigue, as well as sentiment. Its characters are numerous. Its plot is complicated enough to demand and hold the attention, and the interest is skillfully maintained throughout. 
The story moves rapidly and there is no time for frills, but when occasion demands, Mrs. Wood is able to rise to great emotional heights. Young William's death, for instance, is famous. Though it is interesting to note that Lady Isabel never utters in the book that much quoted outburst, dead and never called me mother. That belongs to the dramatic version of the novel, which has been played all over the world, so successfully that it has been estimated that if the author had received even the smallest royalty on the performances, she would have earned during her lifetime a quarter of a million pounds sterling. As it was, she never received a penny. East Lynne, as a play, is still as popular as the novel itself. Indeed, it has become a proverbial saying in repertory theatres, when in doubt, put on East Lynne. The author was born on the 17th of January 1814, the daughter of Thomas Price, a glove manufacturer of Worcester. Brilliant, even precocious as a child, at the age of 13 she was able to repeat neither the whole of Shakespeare's plays by heart. In 1836 she married Henry Wood, a prominent member of a banking and shipping firm, and became Mrs Henry Wood, a name under which she was to become world famous. She had already won a prize of a hundred pounds offered by the Scottish Temperance League for a propagandist novel, Dainsbury House, written at the surprisingly early age of 17. But her serious literary career was not to begin until she had been married for three years and had gone to live in France, where, when, when she at length satisfied her desire to write a romantic novel and began East Lynne. Already, however, Mrs. Wood had come beneath the shadow of ill health that was to overcast the remainder of her life. In, in the middle of writing Eastlin, she became afflicted by a mysterious nervous disease which threatened to paralyse her hands. This was cured by an unknown woman who must be one of the earliest recorded faith healers of the 19th century. But the paralysis, paralysis returned after a period of some months and though Mrs. Wood was able to complete many more long novels, these were written mostly lying on her, on her back with a writing pad held uncomfortably above her head. In 1866, Mr. Wood died and his widow returned to England and settled in Upper Norwood. It was here that she wrote and published anon anonymously what are perhaps the best of her short stories, the Johnny Ludlow stories. Mrs. Wood died of heart failure in 1887 and was buried in Highgate Cemetery, where her impressive tomb may still be seen. I will put a link in the show notes. Of all her works, East Lynne is considered by far the best. Perhaps because it was written during the first happy years of marriage and when she was still in health. East Lynne has a freshness and romantic charm which is apparently sadly lacking in her other works. East Lynne is not without its tears but is completely free from what can only be termed the sententious gloom of the Channings or of Mrs Halliburton's troubles. Long after these books are forgotten, East Lynne will be read by every succeeding generation of those who feel that there's always room for romance and sentiment in the world. Now I'm going to read the first couple of paragraphs of the first page of the first chapter. Let me know in the comments below if you are not immediately drawn into the story. In an easy chair of the spacious and handsome library of his townhouse sat William, Earl of Mount Severn. His hair was grey, the smoothness of his expansive brow was defaced by premature wrinkles, and his once attractive face bore the pale, unmistakable look of dissipation. One of his feet was cased in folds of linen, as it rested on a velvet ottoman, speaking of gout as plainly as any foot ever spoke yet. It would seem, to look at the man as he sat there, that he'd grown old before his time, and so he had. His years were barely nine and forty, yet in all save years he was an aged man. A noted character had been the Earl of Mount Severn, not that he had been a renowned politician, or a great general, or an eminent statesman, 
or even an active member of the upper house. Not for any of these had the Earl's name been in the mouths of men, but for the most reckless among the reckless, for the spendthrift among, among spendthrifts, for the gangster among gangsters, and for a debonair man outstripping the debonair. By these characteristics did the world know Lord Mount Severn. It was said his faults were those of the head, that a better heart or more generous spirit never beat in human form, and there was much truth in this. Now for an announcement of a new feature that I will be trying out on Friday from the Two-Handed Comedy Theatre, which features a special guest. So ring the notifications bell if you want to see the specially written short comedies for this booktube channel. So that's all folks, and remember to comment, subscribe, like and share, and I'll be back soon with another booktube video.